Thanks, Amy. What an incredible presentation and a tough one to follow, of course. Um, my name is Rodrigo Davis. Um, I'm from the Center for Civic Media, which is a research group uh, within the Media Lab at MIT. And um, I'm here today to talk to you about crowdfunding, um, crowdfunding for civic projects, um, a very new area which I'm calling civic crowdfunding. Before we get started, uh, can you just raise your hand if you've ever given to a crowdfunding campaign or started one? Okay, great. All right, we're off to a good start then. Um, and hopefully the conceptual continuum clue is uh, sort of going to be easier to pick up on for you guys given you already know um, the field to some extent. Um, so very briefly, and Butch gave me a nice introduction, so I'll do this quickly. Um, as I said, I'm a researcher at the Center for Civic Media at MIT. Um, I'm a graduate student in Comparative Media Studies. And right now, this summer, I'm working for the mayor of San Francisco in the Office of Civic Innovation. Um, you're probably wondering what that is. Um, I'll explain it to you if you're interested afterwards. Um, but broadly, we do um, technology and innovation projects across departments in government. Um, and in the past, I've worked with uh, SpaceHive, which is a crowdfunding platform for civic projects. I work with UNDP um, and a few others. And to answer the question, quite a few people have asked me in the past two days. I am much older than I look. Okay, so um, so let's get started then. Um, there are kind of six questions that I want to ask um, in this talk, and, and offer some answers. Uh, I don't pretend any of them are complete answers, but hopefully, it'll get you thinking about the space in a different way. Um, the first would be, what is civic crowdfunding? Secondly, where does it come from and what's the history? Thirdly, I'm going to give a few examples of how people are using it right now in the civic space. Um, fourthly, what are some of the opportunities, benefits um, in this field? And of course, what are the risks and the problems we face? Um, fifthly, what do we know about what works? What's been successful so far? And then finally, um, what role and um, what types of roles can civic organizations such as some of the groups um, that you all work with play in this process. So I'll kick off briefly then with what is civic crowdfunding. Um, it seems like most of you have a reasonable grasp of crowdfunding itself. Um, but in terms of the civic space, we're talking about the same structure um, of fundraising where you get um, a whole kind of gamut of, of groups from individuals through community groups down to government uh, giving money, uh, giving resources into a centralized campaign, uh, which is run by a campaign manager, and most people don't sleep very much, so, so feel for them. Um, the campaigns are run on crowdfunding platforms such as Kickstarter, Indiegogo, IOB, and SpaceHive are ones that exist only in the civic and community space. And kind of leveraging all that effort to produce a community service of a kind. And that, for me, is what differentiates civic crowdfunding from, say, crowdfunding a watch or a crowdfunding a movie. The output is a service for communities. Um, it is a community-owned asset of a certain kind. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I've been doing fundraising for X years. How is uh, doing this kind of fundraising through a website different? And that's a great question to ask. Um, there are a few differences, but five kind of areas that I want to draw your attention to, um, which I think are, are particular to, to crowdfunding, um, are these. Um, first is the urgency, getting people to give usually in a six week time frame is typical for most platforms. Secondly, um, as you saw in that previous slide, um, a very, very diverse range of sponsors. So you can have everybody from a corporation to your neighbor giving money. Um, the third thing is that most sites operate by pledges rather than donations. So if I open a campaign and I say I want to raise $10,000, uh, folks will put in their pledges. And if I don't reach that target, um, then those folks get their money back. That's not the case for, for all platforms, but it is for most of them. Uh, the fourth thing I wanted to mention is rewards. You've probably noticed if you've given to a, a Kickstarter campaign or an Indiegogo campaign, but often, depending on how much um, you give, you get something back, which could be anything from uh, a bumper sticker up to dinner with the director or something. By the way, just out of interest, has anybody received a reward from a crowdfunding campaign? Um, I'm just going to pick one person. What was it? Yeah, I'm looking at you. Oh. Yeah, what did you get? Um, one I got a bumper sticker and the other one I got a t-shirt. Okay. Perfect, so good, good examples of the kind of small scale rewards that these campaigns give out. 
Um, and, and the final thing I wanted to mention um, about crowdfunding, if you're wondering how, how it's different from other fundraising, is that there's very much a sense of symbolic ownership. Um, there are some, uh, a sort of a new area that will evolve here when the uh, SEC changes regulations, is that you will be able to own shares in things that you crowdfund. Currently, um, and I think in the civic space, this is probably the way it will remain for most people, um, the ownership is, is symbolic. So you have a sense that you belong to you know, the community center that you helped to fund, for example. You have a sense that you have a stake in a social program that you helped fund. Okay, so I've been talking a bit about, um, you know, this is similar to existing fundraising, um, but where does this idea of this sort of urgent, centralized campaign involving small donations come from? Well, here's a clue, it's not the internet. Um, I've been doing some research into the history of different types of fundraising, and I was really fascinated looking in the archives of the New York Public Library. Is there anybody from the NYPL here still? No, maybe not. Um, well, anyway, thanks to the guys from the NYPL for their fantastic microfilm records. Um, I was looking at the, um, the records of the New York World, which was a newspaper that Joseph Pulitzer um, was proprietor of for a number of years. And in 1885, Pulitzer started a campaign in the uh, newspaper to pay for the platform that the Statue of Liberty currently stands on. Um, Obviously, the, the statue itself was donated by the French. It was designed by Bartholdi. Um, the platform was the responsibility of an organization that was called the American Committee. It was a consortium of cities. They needed to raise $200,000 um, for this, which is about 2.5 million to, in today's money. And they actually failed to do so. They had a $100,000 shortfall. Um, and Pulitzer, being the kind of um, I guess, big man around town that he was, decided that this was a disgrace and kind of a shame on New York City. And through his newspaper, um, he started a campaign to raise this money. And he did so. They were successful. In five months, they raised $100,000. Um, that came, the, the most exciting thing about this, um, from my perspective, is that came from 120,000 donors. So the average person was giving less than a dollar. And if you look at the archives of the newspaper, they were chronicling that on a daily basis. You had letters from readers saying, you know, my son or daughter is pledging 20 cents to this campaign. Really incredible um, exercise, and one that I think um, helps humble anybody who is super excited about the power of crowdfunding on the internet um, into realizing that this is something that people are very good at doing. Um, the communities are very good at raising money for themselves and inspiring others um, to help them along the way. Okay, so how are people using it now? Now that they have the internet and they have some of the benefits of being able to reach more people more quickly and process payments uh, more easily than it would be if you were collecting in a basket and taking them in, you know, in a cash bag to the bank. Well, I'm going to talk about three examples quickly. Um, I've written more fully about uh, some of these um, on my blog and on the Center Pacific Media blog. Um, so if you want to dig in more deeply, um, do take a look or, or certainly get in touch with me afterwards. The first kind of use case is filling funding gaps. And this has a lot in common with the uh, Pulitzer example I just talked about. Glen Koch is um, a village in South Wales near Pontypridd, uh, down the road from where I grew up, actually. Um, it's one of the most deprived neighborhoods in the UK. Um, and they wanted to build a community center to replace the one they had, one, a building that was constructed in the 1970s and that was literally falling apart and leaking. Um, they got a, a large amount of grant funding from different sources, but they were missing £40,000 um, to finish this project. The whole project was worth about $1.2 million. Um, and they ran a campaign on SpaceHive, the platform that, that I worked for for a time. I wasn't working there when this campaign happened. I was actually inspired to work with them by this campaign. Um, and they were able to secure this money through a process that was entirely owned by the community. And the community, um, as it happens now, run the center. Um, you know, although there was government funding, it is community managed and owned. They, they got the money from 107 funders, some of which were corporates, most of which were individuals, and they got national press coverage for this. Another use case, um, Kansas City, Missouri. 
built a bike share scheme, um, which was actually launched quite recently. They raised just over four hundred thousand um, dollars. They didn't meet their target actually in this case, or they didn't meet the overall target they had. But they've still been able to launch the service, and they're going into another round of funding. And I, I don't pretend that it's easy to build a bike scheme, but I think um, you know, uh, folks from DC, folks in other cities um, who've seen how much bike share schemes can cost, they usually run into multi-million dollar contracts. Um, and this was done in a much more lean fashion, which is quite incredible, I think. And the final example I want to talk about, which could be quite relevant, I think, to, to a few people in the room, is thinking about crowdfunding as something you can inject into public-private partnerships. Now, whatever you think about public-private partnerships and that model, um, one thing that we could do to improve it would be to open the number of people who can be the private partner. Um, and, I, and crowdfunding is one way that you can do that. The New York DOT has a program called Plaza where uh, they are able to lease out for one to two years spaces um, that they own, which are typically at intersections, hence this um, this graphic here, and they can say to uh, private partners, uh, come and manage this uh, for a couple of years, put on some kind of programming, create some kind of resource, and we will match fund. Uh, so if you come up with a great program, we'll help you put down the gravel, we'll help you put down the benches. Um, and this is exciting because they're quite small scale projects. We're talking um, about contracts that are less than $10,000, and so in the reach of communities to raise, and there are a number um, of those campaigns ongoing on IOB, which is a New York-based civic crowdfunding platform. And they um, are a very interesting uh, company because they also recruit specifically from underserved areas, underserved communities in New York and also in Miami. Okay then, so maybe you're feeling a little bit excited, skeptical about this. Um, let's talk about some of the good things and then some of the risks. And this kind of is where I'll put on more of my academics hat and try and critically analyze the field. So what are the good things about what I've been talking about? Well, uh, the first thing is, in theory, you can raise more money faster and, uh, for, and, and sort of invest less in that effort because you're putting something on a website. But of course, the big caveat would be that you're gonna raise this in smaller amounts. So your donations are likely to be smaller from each person and the amounts you raise as a campaign are not going to be the same as you would raise from two or three uh, large foundations, for example. One of the other good things is that you can create a community out of those people that you've raised money from. And you've got a large number of people there who, even if they've only given five or ten dollars, are interested in your organization and what you're trying to do, and maybe people who you would love to have at your events and to have on your outreach list, etc. You also get a chance to reach a new audience, so the person who perhaps can't afford your $100 membership fee, but does like the organization and does want to give $10. But of course there are some risks here, um, which I'm sure a lot of you have thought through already, but I'm just gonna uh, mark a couple. Um, and I think these are especially important in the civic space and when we talk about anything that involves government or, or something that is, that is quasi-public. The first would be how do we ensure this is fair? How do we ensure um, that it's not just the better off communities that, that benefit from this because they're better able to perhaps ask for money, they, there's more disposable income in their communities. And that's a question I'm looking at at MIT, trying to figure out who is benefiting from these kinds of schemes so far and how can we enlarge that pool. The other thing I want to mention is sustainability, where we're all here to talk and think about sustainability. Um, here, you know, crowdfunding campaigns are typically quite short-lived in terms of the, the time that they take, and often they can be quite short-lived in terms of um, the sort of spending plan. So maybe we're trying to raise money for something we're going to launch, so what happens afterwards? And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And then the final thing is fulfillment. You know, you've given money to something, how can you be sure that it's going to be delivered? Um, and that's a question that a lot of uh, crowdfunding websites have run into, and there have been a number of um, quite prominent cases of people not delivering. And so if you're a civic organization thinking about running a campaign, you have to think about how will you communicate to others that you can deliver what you promised. Okay, so briefly then, what works? What do we think makes a good campaign? And these are, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I just want to mention a few things. Firstly, be very clear about what you're asking for. 
people need to know exactly what the money is going to be spent on. Secondly, you need to pre-build the support so you don't just book it and people come. Um, you tell people before you open the campaign that this is something you want to do. And perhaps if you have an existing kind of fundraising strategy, this is something that you can, you can kind of give people a heads up that it's coming. Because when you get that campaign started, you need momentum. You need uh, to be able to sustain people's interest throughout the six weeks or however long you're running it for. And of course, to do that, you need exposure. We're all um, competing in an attention economy, especially online. And crowdfunding campaigns that succeed tend to get media coverage, um, whether that is the media you generate yourselves, uh, giving people updates on what you're doing, or whether that's in the kind of media partners you traditionally reach out to. And then finally, um, uh, kind of picking up the point I made uh, just on the previous slide, um, you need to be able to win people's trust. You need the endorsement of people um, who can guarantee that you will deliver on what you said you would. So if you're thinking about, okay, this is a nice idea, I like Kickstarter campaigns, I loved my tote bag, I loved my bumper sticker, how does my organization fit into this? Well, there are a number of different models, this is a new field, and it's very much evolving, but I just want to point out four uh, potential models that you might think about based on a couple of cases that I've looked at. Um, and I'm going to go quite quickly over these, so feel free to ask me um, more questions later. And the four models are, firstly, you could be a promoter. So you, this is very much the kind of 1.0 model. You could upload your campaign to Kickstarter or Indiegogo or, or the rest, uh, and you could raise money for it. And you're the person who is crafting that copy, getting your friends and associates and partners to give to it, um, and then you're probably paying a commission to one of those websites. The second role um, is that you're a curator, so you partner with an existing crowdfunding site and you say, okay, um, my organization is interested in campaigns across communities that deal with a particular theme. Um, so this one here, uh, the picture is a high street related campaign that Spacehive partnered with the Association of Town Centre Managers in the UK, which is a membership organization of chief, chief executives of town centres. So anything that relates to town centres that comes from, say, an individual in uh, you know, town A, if the town centre manager is part of this campaign, they see that's been uploaded to Space Hive, they can uh, bring it sort of within this initiative and get more um, kind of exposure for it. And if you have a kind of national campaign that you're curating, it's much easier to attract the kind of corporate uh, backing you might need uh, to attract the kind of foundations who are looking for scale. The third kind of model is to be a facilitator. And what this really means is you're not going to run a crowdfunding campaign, you're not going to curate a crowdfunding initiative of a kind, you're just going to say to people in your network, this is something that should be in your toolkit. So if you have partners who need to raise money, you can help them um, be educated about their options, you can help them and support them in running a campaign. Um, you can essentially hand help hold them through the process um, so that they know this is an option. Say there's a community you work with and you think they would be great for the Plaza program and you think there's some tie into your organization, that's an approach you could take. This is something we're doing in San Francisco with Living Innovation Zones, which is similar to the Plaza program. Um, it's a way for people to use underutilized public spaces. And we're telling community organizations, startups, that if they want to be a partner in this scheme, Crowdfunding is a tool that they should look at, and we're giving them some support in doing that. And the final way is that you um, essentially roll this into your own organization. You start your own platform uh, using some of the open source code that's out there. You host the campaign on your own site. And this is the most, I suppose, high risk of, of the models. Um, one sort of prominent example I've seen is the Long Now Salon, which is a sort of a think tank uh, based in San Francisco in the Bay Area, which is raising money for a library, a salon that it has. Um, it's currently raised about half of a half million dollar target. So those are kind of the four models um, that I'm interested in. Now very quickly, if you're thinking, where do we get started? Um, three quick bits of advice. Start with your own community. So start with the people who already support you. Um, think about the fundraising efforts that have happened in the past and the history of fundraising and all of the skills you have in that area. And finally, remember that this is a new tool, a new toy now, 
but pretty soon a lot of people are going to be using it. So if you are interested, engage with it, analyze it critically, and think about how it might work for your organization. And feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you.